<laughs> All right. I guess I'll go ahead and get started then. Um, thanks so much for joining us on Zoom tonight. As Natalie mentioned, I'm Angela McQuillan. I'm the curator at the Esther Klein Gallery, which is part of the Science Center. So since the gallery is closed for the foreseeable future, um, we've decided to take our programming into virtual space and we've launched a series of artist tours. So today is our second tour in the series and we're um, really excited to be speaking with Cindy Stockton Moore. So I first connected with Cindy in um, 2000, 2017 when she exhibited some of her work at the Esther Klein Gallery as part of a group show that was organized by the artist collective Grizzly Grizzly. Um, Cindy creates beautiful and thoughtful site-specific installations, large-scale ink drawings, sometimes on paper, sometimes directly on the wall itself. And she's also done a lot of interesting video work that incorporates her drawings and her own body. Um, her studio is located inside of her home, which is um, in Fishtown in Philadelphia. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and welcome Cindy and let her take it from here. Great. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, what we thought we'd do is start off with kind of an overview of my work, just like a 10 minute, like best, best of slideshow. And then we can just start to pull things out in the studio, like as if, um, as if we're all in the space together, which would be nice. Oh, and just real quick, I wanted to put your website up on the chat just in case, like if people want to flip through it while you're speaking as well. So I'll do that right now. Great. And I will do this right now. Uh oh. Maybe that's not a good link. Oops. That's not what I want to do. This is what I want to do. Does that, that look legit? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, as Angela said, I, I'm a painter. I work with ink primarily or other water-based media. And all of my work, um, if I had to summarize it, would be um, that it's um, interested in the relationship between, um, between people and nature. And um, so that the landscape is always a very big part of, um, of the work. And also um, the idea of time and, and um, temporary omnis um, of things is a big part. So the fugitive nature of time and um, man and landscape. So those are the overarching themes. And um, they're done with pretty simple means. They're ink on paper or ink directly on wall, um, sometimes with gouache. And with the site specific work, um, so you can see the scale of the paintings I just showed you in the background here of this um, exhibition. And um, you can also see that I had the ability to paint directly on the wall for this show. And so when that happens, um, they're site specific in that they respond to the architecture, but then also to the site and to the thematics of the show as a whole. So this is just ink directly on wall. All of these are meant to be temporary so that um, at the close of a show, they're, they're painted over and they just exist as documentation and memories. I included this one because it was like one of the first ones I did and it was just um, if we were meeting in person at Venture Cafe, it would be just right up the street at what's now the Pearlman, um, the Pearlstein Gallery, sorry. Um, and when it was undergoing construction, I had um, in an exhibition just sort of hid these little paintings around. And so sometimes they're very small and hidden and sometimes they can be quite large. Um, this was at Art Space Liberty and this was like a 50 foot span. And so with these site-specific um, drawings and paintings, so this is graphite and watercolor, um, they can change from site to site. And so I'll often perform the same piece multiple times. And so in that way, it's, it's um, a little more similar to music than you know, a traditional show where a piece travels with because it is performed differently in each space. And the way that they respond to the space is sometimes like um, chromatically. So this was at Moore College of Art and Design, also in Philly. And um, the space itself um, is very sort of cavernous and gray and white, but it was also a, a winter show. And at the time, um, I had um, I was been working on it a lot um, with the specific text by Camus. And um, in my studio, I was working through these ideas. And these projects, they come up for me, but then sometimes, um, almost always, other projects intervene. 
So as I'm working on one set of things, um, right before that I had done this, um, this great residency with um, Adrienne Mackey um, called Cross Pollination. And she's a theater make maker based in Philadelphia who would pair artists in different genres. So I was paired with Ken Colfus, the novelist, and we did this, um, we did this interactive performative walk throughout um, Kensington Fishtown. And um, that piece in and of itself was totally unrelated in many ways to my work. But when I came back to doing this project kind of concurrently, what happened was I had gotten really comfortable with the idea of, oh, I'll call up an actress and we'll talk about this text and we'll work through the poses, not as artist and model, but as like collaborative collaborators. So we discussed the um, text and we actually met in Clark Park, um, so another West Philly connection, and um, worked out these series together. And Philadelphia as a site, so I was putting this together, I was kind of pulling all the Philadelphia ones because I've been here for I guess 10 years now. And so the, my landscape is, is shifting to where in the beginning, even when I was in New York, a lot of the landscapes I was drawn to were still um, my Floridian roots, like this or that first mangrove I showed you, but um, just becoming more embroiled in Philly landscape. So this is a site drawing um, of Devil's Pool, and the detail kind of just shows you that they're really loose. It's like it's not much ink, and um, the site. Oh, where is Devil's Pool? Where is Devil's Pool? Oh, we, we have a hike in store for you. So Devil's Pool is um, in Fairmount Park along the Wissahickon. Um, it's a very popular um, swimming site. Um, it is a semi-contested swimming site. Um, has great, like, um, yes. So beca because of that, um, um, this piece was based on a George Song writing that kind of dealt with that as well, too. So it's a really popular place to, um, to swim in Wissahickon Park. You can jump. It tends to also um, get a lot of like litter and there's a, a bunch of also um, conversation about how or when the, how or if the weather, um, the water is really safe to swim in there, but it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful site to explore. And the, this scene is actually um, taken from, um, I'm not working with models at all. These are people observed at Devil's Pool over a period of time. So when you say that you work with models, do you take pictures of them or do you draw from life or both? Both, but mostly photos, mm -hmm. mostly photos. Yeah, um, it's a real um, gift to be able to draw from life. So when, when I have the option, like when I'm teaching figure drawing, it's hard to actually like teach it because I want to be doing it so much. But um, for my studio work, yeah, it's almost all photos. And a lot of that is because it has to be me a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And then other times it's like, how can I ask my friends to, to participate or working with the model? It's a really sad number of times, so lots of photos. Has anyone, has anyone here been, been to Devil's Pool? Yeah, okay, great job. Yeah. Well, we'll plan a hike, it's good. <laughs> so the same site, um, I visited, um, again, not, um, I visit all the time actually, but um, in this work that was at Matt Airy. So it's the same site, it's just rescaled. You'll actually see Rachel here in the corner. So this is a new cast and populated in an entirely different way. So again, um, with a music analogy, like a lot of the time, it's like, it's not really recycled imagery, but it's that these ideas are kind of come back around in a different refrain for me. Oh, and Mount Airy has this great Wissahickon schist in the space itself. So the rocks, I love that the rocks of their wall are the same rocks that just gathered right up, right up the block. Oh, so that's just the way the gallery wall is. That is the gallery wall. Okay, I've never actually been there. Oh yeah, that's the gallery wall. There's one wall that's just built right into the schist of their uh, garage space. So this has led to some inst um, like <clears throat> animations. And at first I tried to do stop animations, but they end like, it's, they're such ghosted images that they were kind of hard to see. So instead I've settled to sort of scrubbing and repainting and redrawing on the same exact square of wall. Um, I've worked with sort of overlays of Duralar that um, allows the ink to kind of pool and I can record it that way. Um, and this project was for a Grizzly Grizzly show. Um, 
that um, was that first connection Angela and I, uh, Angela spoke of. It's another way it kind of pushes me outside of my comfort zone. So you can see this um, is like a big jump, but again, concurrent projects um, that kind of feed each other. So with Grizzly Grizzly, we're sometimes invited to do group shows. Um, I'm not a member anymore, but when I was, um, we sometimes get paired in these ex exhibitions. And I was um, slated to be in a show with a friend and, um, and we were supposed to share this wall, but we both do large scale work. And they both they wanted large scale work from us, so instead we we made this project together as sort of a solution to a space issue. So um, this is Michael Conrad. He makes the um, this tie back is, is his DIY back. It's all made from um, single use plastic bags, hand cut and um, and ironed together. And so when he's building this structure we had to have like these long conversations of like how our work is so different how is it going to interact and what it led me to do was kind of look at the nature in, in my neighborhood um and where i am it's not quite fishtown I'm, I'm in kensington and there was this block um sorry it's not a block it's my block there was this lot two doors down from me that had this great tree that was sort of growing into this fence and so we ended up using it as a device for this show but in the process I became kind of obsessed with this one parcel of land and I found myself as these other more reach, recess like research oriented projects were coming in I kept going back in the studio to paint these large scale paintings of this particular lot and what happened is over a period of three years that lot um, was sold and then later turned it into condos. So over that period of time, I was able to kind of document that change. And then this was a show of the work in Arlington. I didn't put many in because I was gonna just pull them out later. <laughs> um, once the world is not on pause anymore, I wanted to quickly invite you to come see some projects that are currently up. At Eastern State Penitentiary, I have um, this installation. It's called Other Absences. It is a series of 50 portraits. You get like a scale idea of um, people, they're portraits of people who were um, murdered by future or past, um, they were murdered by inmates at Eastern State Penitentiary. So um, you'll see the portraits and then below that series of 50, there's a ledger that tells a bit about the person. Um, and then at the bottom is a postscript, also the relationship of the inmate to Eastern State. It was a different lens of um, viewing the really complex and interesting story of Eastern State. And is this a permanent fixture at the penitentiary? It's not. It's been there for a really long time, though. So um, I think that, like, if I was renewed again this year, so it'll be up through this year. And I think that'll be the sixth year, maybe? It's been up for a very long time. And um, as, like, when we were first discussing this it was a big question of like oh they're paintings they're not gonna last but it's surprisingly well they're, they're doing fine they're happy there and the other installation that's currently up but again um you can't visit quite yet is at glenn ford on the delaware which is this historic mansion and the installation i've done there is in the historic um, period bedroom of florence fordero tonner and it's a suite of large scale, um, oops, large scale paintings, and then artifacts from the collection that I've gone through and sort of reshuffled throughout the house. So um, we'll talk about the concepts of that later, but for the most part, I've kind of repopulated different areas of the mansion in addition to the room with um, things that I've created or culled or, um, or copied from the uh, archives to tell a different, to tell a different story. And this project like Eastern State or some of the other I've mentioned, they're kind of really based in like long-term research and all kinds of stuff. So in the center is a video, it has some animation, has some live footage. Um, and going back to that kind of, um, going back to the, the sort of web way of working that I was working. So simultaneous to doing this project, which was a good span of a year while I was in residence there, I was invited to this great project with Tom Judd, um, the Chalkboard Chronicles. And so it was like a, a one or two day drawing. And so while I was there, I decided to make that process into an animation. And you can see in the lower right hand corner, 
um, of the slide that that animation made it into the final video. So it was like part of the same thing. And while I was at that weekend um, doing the chalkboard drawing, I got this really like the connection of the Delaware River is also a, a big part of these projects and that specific tree. And I was able to take a lot of footage that later I used, if you look in the lower left hand corner, from the music video for Rachel's um, solo release, that we were also able to film at the home. So like the interconnectedness of the process is just always a big way that I think that things grow organically for me. So it was worth noting. So speaking of, this is where I'm ending. This is what I'm doing now. I'm like gathering a lot of twigs and nuts and um, started to make inks in my own studio so that this next series is going to be made, the, the landscape is going to be made from the landscape as well. And I'm specifically been interested in invasive um, species, which is not, not the oak, but a lot of the vines that I'm using are things that should not be there. Um, and just finding a way to actually use the materiality of those things to talk about that relationship. And those, I'm, so I'm like burning some twigs, grinding them up, making them into animations as well. And that is this. Is that a brief enough? That, that was great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions before Cindy moves on to her physical work? <laughs> you want to just start pulling some stuff out? Yeah, that would be great. So behind Cindy is her studio. And I'm gonna like, oh, and if you look like one of the things about my studio is that a lot of those, um, a lot of those drawings, I have to test out the, all those site specific work. I have like a day or two to do them on site. So I'll paint them in advance. So you can see like all of the tests of these figures, but they still live directly on my wall. So like there's some chain link down there, there's some stuff there. I make the galleries paint over it, but I don't paint over them. <laughs> is, that, is that just because it's too sad for you? No, I just like to live with them. They're my, you know, they're my ghosts to live with, I feel like. I like to have the little remnants of things around. Do you ever approach, like when you're doing a show and you know that the work is going to be painted over, do you approach that differently than you would something that's more permanent? No, the, um, well, actually that's not true. Yes. Yeah, I think I do. I think it's liberating to me when it's, when it's impermanent. And I think it allows me to be much open, mm -hmm. much more open and um reactive and i can't overwork it so you were asking for like failed things like yeah. i have some things in my studio that like i could beat on it forever but i, I killed it a while ago yeah so it's just like i was just an autopsy at this point i'm just but for those of you who are not artists you ha we have the tendency to just keep working on something when it's already done and by working on it more you're kind of ruining it so i suppose in this sense you only have like a few days to install the piece so you can't do that when it's yeah, and that's with all my media right so ink is like that i used to I do fresco you know like things that i have to but even mm -hmm. even at like if i go to the batting cages i can't hit the slow pitches <laughs> like i feel like I just, it's just not the it's not my personality yeah okay there is a way that this works Are small scale drawings for you, right? <laughs> What's a small scale drawing? I mean, these, these, these are small for, for a lot of your work. Um, I guess. But they, they're smaller versions of all of these. Yeah. So that's another thing about like the bigger work. Once these are not falling down, I can, I can get the studies for these. Part of the reason I can be a little freer with these is because um, I have studies. Right. I've already painted them. So like I can bang this out really quick because I've already done it. Mm -hmm. I've drawn it really detailed. I've painted it once or twice. And then when I get to here, I can kind of let go because of that. Because I practice it, right? Like if we're thinking about this as a performance, I, I like have the muscle memory of doing it. Yeah. 
Can you see sort of the better the scale of things here? Ooh. Definitely. There's an angle situation that's going on here that was <laughs> not happening before. And these are painted in ink? Yes. So these are all ink that I did not make. I didn't make any of this ink. Is that kind of stay? Um, but something like this would have some gouache on it as well. Okay. Really pink in there. So all that white. You? Yes. Yeah. It's almost always me because it's normally <laughs> me with the camera <laughs> in the woods alone. It's kind of my. Well, I feel like a lot of your work is very um, contemplative and sort of meditational and even when you have multiple figures in your, oh, That's bound to happen. that was my fault i distracted you i was saving that for the end <laughs> i was saving that for like the grand finale right. not for that <laughs> no but i was saying um a lot even when you have a lot of figures in your work they're kind of all doing their own thing and kind of gazing into their own space so do you feel like in your daily life you have like some kind of I don't know mindfulness practice or or solitude or something that you do to like get you into that space because I feel like it kind of emanates in your work um no I think <laughs> I live the opposite of that <laughs> so maybe this is like a way for you to 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 do that almost maybe. Like in art yeah yeah it is a way um to slow down yeah and I think that's another thing. Um, let me just take this down because I'm looking at something. Um, is that even the even the paintings are they're like really low, they're low contrast, so you can't you can't see them like you really can't even see them that well from you know like this far away. Mm -hmm. So they're just it, they're kind of slow. So yeah, I feel like a lot of the colors are like blues and cool colors. So it's like calming, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And sometimes, yeah. And I feel like in the beginning, that was probably like a ploy to like sneak it. Like um, none of the recent series, I used to do like just a lot of like sort of like, you know, drowning or like isolate. There was like a lot of sort of implied doom mm. that I think is not, maybe it's there less. Yeah. That's a kind of peacefulness too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be like accepting of it almost. Yeah. Um, so when you create site specific work, like I feel like a lot of your uh, shows that you prepare for, you have a show in mind, you have a space in mind um, when you're creating your, your exhibition. Do you, um, does your, like how much of the idea do you have planned out before you see the space and how much of seeing the space informs the idea for your show? Hmm. I think, yeah, that depends. So sometimes I, it's, hmm. If, if I'm given enough freedom, it informs it a lot. And if I have a long enough period of time. Yeah. So like something at like Glenn Ford, where it probably took me six months of working to even know what I was going to do there, mm -hmm. um, changed really radically whereas if it's a project that needed a very specific proposal then i'll like then i'll i'll stay within those parameters pretty pretty tight. Yeah. so for your glenn ford um project how much time did you have to do that and and how was that structured like could you just go in and look through their archives yeah it was awesome <laughs> <laughs> i would just got like a big ring of keys and i just wow. dig around yeah. So who was Florence T Tonner? Is that how you say her name? Yes. So Florence Porter Tonner was the final um, resident who was part of the families that it had, that estate had um, mm -hmm. passed down to. And she was the last one to live there before donating it to the Lutherans. Now that site is um, part of Parks and Rec. It is um, a city owned um, historic site. But prior to that, she had donated to the Lutheran. So she was the sort of last in the line of um, people who lived there. And she was a really interesting um, character. She was a really interesting person. So she was a poet. So a lot of the research that I did was going through her poetry and incorporating some of her poetry in there. She was an artist. 
And so I have some drawings of her in there as well, um, by her as well. Um, but she was also a very big accumulator of things. And so um, a lot of the collection comes from her, and some of which is um, genuine and some of which is not. And um, there was like, in, like, I just got to pour through all her personal letters. And like, oh, wow. Yeah. So it was really, um, yeah, I have sort of conflicted um, feelings about that level of wealth and how certain people were treated, but then, you know, she kept surprising me. So she, um, one of the images I have in um, one of the trunks is a drawing she did of Edith Emerson. And Edith Emerson was a Philadelphia um, artist who um, started the Woodmere, actually. And she oh. was life partners with Violet Oakley for the last 40 years of her life. And um, Florence Fodorotaner was also a big supporter of Violet Oakley. So like in the midst of her like very, you know, um, doctrine oriented um, beliefs around religion and codification of all of these other social norms, she was also really, a big supporter of women in the arts and like clearly close personal friends. Um, so it was sort of like how, like how telling these specific stories so with her as well kind of opened up that space to not just be a historic home, but also to show the sort of the complexities of like human interaction with that site, so. Definitely. So when you first started that project, did you have access to a bunch of different people's personal um, belongings and you just were drawn to her specifically? Yeah, they have all kinds of stuff. There. <laughs> wow. Stuff there. That's an ongoing residency, so there's lots of opportunities to explore there. So how long were you um, in residence at Glenford? Well, it was sort of really amorphous then. It may have changed, but yeah, I just, it was kind of as long as I needed. I think it was a year and a half I kept oh, going wow. back there. Okay. I, I kind of feel like it, if it was outside of the current pandemic moment, if I was like, hey, can I come in and do this? They would probably be like, yeah, sure. It was a, <laughs> it's a really open site where people, Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. My brother got married there, actually. So it is like an event space that they rent out as well. So that's, that's how I know of it. But um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about why you decided to re-wallpaper the room with like a tree motif? Oh, so that, um, those are all paintings um, that are just built for those recesses. So those recesses were already there. Mm -hmm. That specific tree is a cucumber magnolia that's on the property, not very far away from where that room is. And that tree is at least 150 years old. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful tree worth visiting just for the tree. If you're like a tree person. Um, but it's, it's very near the end of its life cycle. So that tree, I, you know, the, potentially could live a little bit longer mm -hmm. um, in tree terms, but um, kind of really interested in the span of history that a tree like that leading to a historic home um, kind of puts things in perspective. And also just it being so near to the end of its life cycle, just had that sort of mournful quality that I'm often after. And that also informs them there's a gradation of that tree repeat that kind of um, goes from some twilight to kind of dark so yeah yeah it's really beautiful um and also it was just like physically i was making all these animations i was doing all these research and sometimes it just gets to a point where i'm like wait a second like i i am a painter like i want to be doing big paintings like i like why am i it's so it's kind of that like balance between oh i could do that but i yeah i probably do that too Definitely. Does anyone have any um, comments or questions for Cindy at this moment? Oh, it's so check in. All right. So um, in our tour last week, Margarita Hagan, another artist, showed us one of her clay pieces that had completely collapsed and <laughs> her whole process of repairing it. So we're seeing all these beautiful images from you that all are amazing. Do you ever have like a drawing completely fail and if you do what do you do when that happens all the time sometimes um so this one oh my poppy stands in the way this one on this back wall oh i don't know what's going poppy stand but i'll pull some i'll pull some other gems out too mostly i throw them away um this guy i keep around 
So it failed as one painting, and then I painted a tree on top of it, and then that failed, and I painted something else on top of it. It's never going to be a good painting. <laughs> but I live with it because it is, there's something. A lot of work to put in there, you know? There are ideas that didn't work, so I got to find them back. This down here, actually, this was a, this was an animation technique. I was trying to like scroll. I actually have all these little birds that fly over this landscape. It's like based on some like canoeing situation I did. Um, that never turned into anything. Mm -hmm. um, well, I agree with Natalie. She made a comment. She said, it's not true, it's beautiful. <laughs> it never did the thing it was supposed to do. Oh, I'm kind of into that one. So many people around here just don't know. Ah. So I was doing, um, I had mentioned I'm from Florida. Here, let's get this back to the word there. Um, so I was doing all of these like fruit stands from where I was from when I come back and I just have a whole series of these. They ended up that these ended up being fresco fragments for a different project. But um, when I was trying to figure out what to do before I got to the idea of just making them frescoes and fragmenting them, I started like just cutting them up and like putting them on top of each other. So oh, I have that's cool. piles of these sort of like <laughs> jumbled things. It's not, it's not going like to be that. an artwork in and of itself, but like, there's like an animation thing here, right? Yeah, and, and I, also, I feel like you could display it like with the first layer like jutting out a little bit to give some space, so it's kind of like a pop-up. I tried that, it's so cheesy. <laughs> so cheesy, I tried that. It's, yeah, it's real cheesy. But I do, like, but like, I think there's something, I think there's a video idea here that is like, oh, I'm going to keep it around. But yeah, um, this is... This is, this is what I do. I just, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I had done some of that with this last thing too. So remember I said that I do all of them as test first in different colors. So these are like that same fence. I was trying that with this too. Look how crazy that is. <laughs> I like that. What was I thinking? <laughs> well, maybe there's something, right? Yeah. So yeah, I don't get rid of them. I just, I just keep them. You might need them for something sometime. You never know. You yeah. Know? So we have. Now I have all material failures. I'm having a lot of material failures. Oh, is that because you're making your own inks now? Yes. Yeah. Well, what is the process behind making inks? How does, how does one go about doing that? Because I saw you at the wood mirror one time and you were collecting black walnuts in a bag. Yeah, that made a that's nice one. The <laughs> that's the extent of what I know about that process. This is, this is the wood mirror ink. This is the ink I made from that trip. Oh, wow. Walnut. It's, it's a nice walnut. So walnut is easy. Walnut I like. Um, the, the black ink. And these are just wild like walnuts that they're not like the walnuts you buy at the grocery store. No. So when we're at the windmill, they're in those, those hulls still, those husks that like if you touch, they'll stay in your fingers. So for this batch, I just took all of those walnuts I had gathered. I put them in a jar and let them sit outside in the sun. They just kind of baked into their own beauty. Wow. Um, the black, so this is some um, vine, I think it's lantana, um, that I was cutting out because um, it's invasive species. But it also works with grapevine. So you can kind of cut it down. And then I've been making my own charcoal, which is super Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, really easy. I don't, I don't use charcoal anymore. The last time I used it was when I was in drawing class in art school, but it was pretty expensive to uh -huh. buy like a piece of vine charcoal. It's, and you just make it yourself? <laughs> yeah, it's real fun. So um, a really good container for that is like, this was an Altoids tin. It's like just mm -hmm. lets enough air in. And you can just put those vine bits in, like cut it to fit. And then they like turn in, you just keep them on a fire for a couple hours. So like you go camping. 
and then I grind it down and make it into an ink. The tricky stuff is I've been trying to make like my own shellac. Oh wow, how, I don't even know how this, that- Yes, you can't. So shellac I can't gather because it's, um, do you guys know what shellac is? You never gone deep into I mean, shellac. I know what it is because I bought it from the store, but I don't know, I wouldn't even know how to go about making that. So Andrew, have you made shellac before? No, so this is, this is, so the actual material, I don't know if you can see, this is a really beautiful one. So this, I had to buy this material because shellac is, it's not the shell, it's like kind of misleading in that way, of the lac bug. So oh, wow. there's a bug that secretes this, <laughs> this resin-like stuff on a tree, and then they just pull that off the tree into these, actually the flake, it's, there's, it's a really long, beautiful process. It's like, um, but then the flakes of it, you can kind of suspend in different things, but it's really finicky. So that's really interesting. But um, that'll make, that's doing some fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is really cool. I mean, I love what you're doing with this. And it also reminds me of another artist I've worked with, um, who you might like if you, if you don't know her, her name's Ellie Irons mm -hmm. and she makes inks and, uh, yeah, basically inks out of like invasive weeds in New York city. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and she, she works in more like different colors, I guess. But um, I feel like this is really interesting because we're all sitting at home, like the art supply store is closed. You can order things on Amazon, but it doesn't arrive within any time frame. And who wants to make them work anyway? So you can just go out and gather your own walnuts and make your own ink. And that's like really cool. <laughs> yeah, so in that way, I was like really prepared for this. Yeah, definitely. Like if I need to like cultivate like yeast in a jar or like make some drawing <laughs> implements, some burning some wood, so I'm, I'm there. Wow, that's really <laughs> awesome. Um, Rachel asks, what are you, you using the shellac for? Varnish? Oh, so to make the inks um, have that sheen, right? And to be able to do layers. So um, the charcoal ink is like super matte. Sorry, this is a new, like, I can't take them off these, so, because that's the animation setup I have is that. But even when I paint it, like, look at this. Like, it's still, you know, like, and so I could fix it with gum arabic, which also is, like, nicely tree-related, but not available here. But the shellac, I think, is going to give me that nice um, hardness of the ink. So it's kind of like a medium, almost? Yeah, it's like a binder. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Interesting. No more hairspray. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so yeah. Yeah. That, that's actually really good. So for that, that layer of ink, if anyone, like I have to put coats in between, even with the store-bought ink to get that depth of color. So something like a spray fixative hairspray um, does allow you to do that or like matte medium does too. Yeah. Can you, you were just um, briefly mentioned your animation. Can you talk about um, how you got into animating your drawings? Um, I think that it started um, with Real people quick, wanting me to, to document the process and then just that not being satisfying. Yeah, so. I'm gonna just um, include a, a web link to Cindy's, one of Cindy's animation videos. Um, so when you go through this process, you mentioned earlier that you kind of like, you like to wipe away the drawing or do you use transparencies on top of each other? Both. Okay. Both. And, and what program do you use? Do you just take photos of each piece or? Yes, or videos, short videos. So if it's like a pooling ink, then it has to be linked videos, but otherwise, yeah, I'll just basically like a stop motion technique that I'll just dump into Final Cut. Okay, cool. Can, some of it I do in like some of the cheesier stuff I'll do like right in Photoshop and just use the layers because Photoshop as an animating tool is pretty, pretty fun. But also, yeah, it's real low tech. Do like, you have your I, I gotta, see? Is what? It, do you have your setup um, in our vision that we can see? I have like a, yeah. Everything's on my hand. So like, um, this is a puddle at Heinz. So I have to kind of keep them on the board to register out with the coffee stand. But yeah, so sometimes I'll just do like subsequent um, paintings that are kind of like overlay. And then this one's like 
this one it's like a ripple situation so sometimes i'm just like literally hand painting these little ripples that i can just move around and oh, you wow. know oh that's really cool move them around and play just play yeah play them. and these ones that. the actual walnuts kind of roll in because i have them and they're fun so you have always envisioned animation as being like completely separate drawings, like drawing like 10 like individual drawings, but I didn't realize you could just put elements on top and move them around. Move them around. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and you also do work with green screen as well, right? Yeah, I do. That's another one of like my low tech magic tricks. I really <laughs> like the green screen. Because it's it looks really high tech, I feel like, when I see your work. It Oh, yeah. I feel like sometimes like the bad illusions have the most weight because, uh, yeah, for me, they do. Yeah. Why do you say they're bad illusions? Well, they're just, they're tactile, like sleights of hands, and they're not, they're not like, um, they're not really digitally intensive. They're, 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 yeah, there's just something kind of, um, not, yeah, I don't know. Just feel like they're, they're just low tech. They're not bad. They're just, they're, I don't think there's anything wrong with low tech though. I mean, because I feel like I feel like your your practice is like as drawing is low tech. So it's kind of like incorporating all of this into a more um digital age, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> and um, says she loves the low tech. <laughs> oh, cool. Yes, and, and that we're in this like high tech environment. I'm talking about I'm trying to get Rachel to um, work on a new project that's like really embracing like the witchiness of this next phase. Like oh, the fact that it's just like me as an older woman, like going into the woods and like grinding up my pigment. So, so on a normal so day, I mean, um, you, you have two children, two, two young children. So you and your husband kind of alternate who gets to work in the studio when, how does that work? <laughs> seamlessly yeah I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> um, we like especially now that we're homeschooling and working from home um, yeah we have a, a minute by minute schedule pretty much of who's in yeah. here and where. but it's helpful to have a, a two artist household because we're both vying for that time but we are both also recognizing that the other person needs that time so we make it happen mm hmm and and I think it's great that you guys you know, you live in the same house, but you have completely separate studios from each other. So it's like, this is your personal space that you work in. Yes. I've been with my husband for 20 years now. And we shared a studio once. And how did that work for you? Not so well. <laughs> well, because he, he makes very, if you guys don't know my husband, he makes really large drawings. And at the time we shared the space, I was doing like my, I was like, it was a different series but like i was doing my thing and then he'd be working on some like eight foot drawing of tom cruise and i just could feel the weight of tom cruise staring at me just <laughs> feel it it was really it was like yeah yeah it's definitely important to have like images you like around you while you're working i feel like yeah. but eventually we got headphones too and that helped oh okay it took us like six months to figure that out just don't that helped so this question is for Cindy and also for Andrea oh, yeah. and other artists who I'm are here. talking stuff about Mark and he's here, I just noticed. Oh, hey, Mark. <laughs> um, just a question for all the artists. How are you feeling in this climate with the pandemic going on? I mean, I feel like we all have probably more time at home, but a lot of people are saying that they're not feeling as creative and they're not feeling as inspired. How are you guys feeling during this this really surreal time about art making do you feel like you're being more productive are you asking me that or for everyone for everyone but i suppose i'll ask you <laughs> i'm not feeling more productive really no so in times when you're not feeling as productive, do you, in your studio practice, do you like set times where you have to be in your studio and you kind of sit there or do you just not go in your studio? I go in my studio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's a quiet place in my house with two kids. So that's like a bonus, but also, um, yeah, it's just a, it's a commitment 
to doing it, to being there. So even I, I don't I like, I've been drawing my dog a lot. Like, <laughs> like that's yeah, like I am drawing and I'm doing a thing and that's what I need to do. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm like grinding. I like, I can grind pigments. I can like putter around There's stuff to be done, but this is a huge shift. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good time to be sort of reflective and take the time that you need to to take it all in because we're certainly witnessing something that's so much bigger than us and so much bigger than this real short timeline that we're used to living on. So t we're experiencing time being warped in ways that we've never lived through. So it's I feel unmoored and but okay with it. You know, I'm kind of enjoying the isolation. I don't mind it at all. I'm perfectly busy but as far as being you know digging into my creativity or tapping into something that I had a couple months ago it's I'm like a long way from that right now but I think it's going to come you know charging back we're we're gathering so much right now definitely yeah. there's hope yeah, from gathering right like that, that also is sort of like yeah that there's like this sort of it's not fallow right like this period is not necessarily fallow it's like process you know like there's process already going on mm -hmm. yeah definitely do we have any other artists in the room i'm trying to see who's all here um, no he's not <laughs> he's got the two kids up there i can hear the kids bouncing off of the wall so i know okay um so I know you've spent a lot of time teaching. You were teaching at Drexel and teaching at UArts, right? Yeah, in Philadelphia, I've taught at UArts, Drexel, and more. And then Bucks Outside of Philly. And then, yeah, a bunch of, yeah. But that's, those are my area schools that I've taught at. And you were, you were teaching figure drawing, drawing, animation, classes like that? Um, no, I never, I've never taught an animation class. I like okay. my way. <laughs> do it my own way yeah, yeah. Um, but I do teach some digital classes like uh, image and time like so I do teach some time-based things but yeah no I've taught a lot of different classes 2d yeah. 3d like pretty much all drawing classes you can own some art history yeah so I guess what I'm getting at is I know you recently left teaching like less than a year ago because you felt strongly about about leaving the profession and doing something else. Do you want to talk about any of that? Um, that's been really amazing. It, but also that this, but now we're at like a different point. But um, yeah, that's been a decision that's really good for me. Like I miss my students and that environment. Um, but um, yeah, to redirect all of that attention um, and research back only to like more primarily to my practice and then just direct it differently has been really great. Yeah. yeah. And now you work for the Temple um, Velocity Fund? Yes. Yeah. So that's next week. Um, we're going to come back and talk again and I'm going to be like in my day job persona. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's also like it's easy. It was a really easy transition to make because what I a lot of what I missed about teaching was that like contact with other artists, like doing interesting things. And so being a temple contemporary is like a good source of that. You basically fund smaller um, art projects within Philadelphia. Within Philadelphia. So it's a, um, it's a grant that's um, open only to Philadelphia artists who are looking to do projects within the next year. That is something new for them and like engages the community in like a new and exciting way. So. Mm -hmm. And I just saw a question from Tracy. She says, um, talk about what the gathering process means. And I guess that's referring back to the question about the pandemic. Um, in, in my personal practice, I am doing gathering. I'm taking a lot of photos because there's a lot of surreal imagery going on just around outside the door, going to the grocery store. And I'm also doing a bit of writing. But I've had a hard time myself, like getting into the studio and creating anything of substance. But yeah, do you guys want to talk about the gathering process? Uh, the gathering for me is also like a physical gathering. Like I'm still like picking up some acorns as I'm walking. <laughs> like, so that's a little bit of that, but there's, yeah. Um, but 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I think I'm, I don't know if I'm physically gathering as much as like kind of mentally regrouping. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's for me, that's like a, like an iterative gathering where I'm just like sort of sketching or writing or jotting things down to be able to digest at a point where I'm able to process that. Yeah. I mean, reality changed so suddenly. So it's hard. I feel like we're just kind of still getting used to the way the world is at the moment. I don't know. Um, I I feel like, I don't know how long this is going to go on for, but at some point we'll probably adjust and be able to be, you know, make more sense of it. Um, You know, or, or it might take a lot more time. But Andrew, how are you gathering? Are you physically doing things or? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, did you ask me? Yeah. Uh, no, I meant um, totally psychologically <laughs> gathering and just sort of trying to be present, and, you know, try not to be too worried about the future, try to just tap into the new routines of the day and, and just sort of gathering this sort of presence of, you know, where we are now that's kind of what i meant i totally meant it metaphorically a gathering though you know like making sure the pantry is stocked i mean <laughs> that's new thinking this is like it's so crazy <laughs> yeah so do you all feel like so I, i'm i would definitely say like the word gatherer for me like i'm a gatherer of data so like i'm always wanting to collect and so do you feel like you're collecting more now because of the current situation we're in um, or is that just always your process? And this has just caused you to pause and gather and then kind of create. I think I'm taking in less data. Mm. Yeah, me too. I feel like um, just creatively, I'm, all, I, I'm usually way more active in pursuing a project or pursuing an idea. And right now I just like, I'm kind of like stunned. Yeah. Yeah. And I've also like a little derailed as well, too, because like um, part of like, you know, like you have processes that are in place. And like part of my research was, you know, like based on some sites I was getting ready to go visit in Ukraine. And like, I was like, so I was really into my like Baba Yaga. Like, so I like what I was researching had so much to do with like the next stages of that, which now that they're kind of indefinitely yeah. paused then yeah the gathering is kind of like a, oh i'm now here what tree am i going to climb next right like it's like a really like okay like what's the next yeah so i remember i, I completely forgot you were going to go to ukraine like the week that everything basically shut down yes because you were coming back from paris and you're like it's fine <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, but maybe next week. And then the week afterwards, you were like, it's not fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. So what were you going to do in Ukraine? Well, like some, some just sort of visiting things. But yeah, there are a couple sites that just have like these really like rich, like centuries old pagan and witch sort of like histories to them, like in the middle of the woods. And there's all of this great, like, um, yeah, natural uh, folklore. That's that same borderline of like, scary and um not that i'm done. <laughs> it's like a lot of like hiking and sketching to go by yourself or bring the kids no kids oh that's amazing so i'm really sorry you missed that trip <laughs> <All right. laughs> um so we're great have... gatherers if you ever need like someone to get a lot of like small twigs it's really helpful actually to have a five and an eight-year-old alone <laughs> alone it's very good work um, so I just want to let everyone know we have about five minutes left. If anyone has any comments or questions for Cindy, now is the time. This is going to sound really basic maybe, but how do you make that charcoal? You said you have to put it in a tin and then put it in a fire? Yes. So basically, if you are in a place where you can make a fire, you can make charcoal? Yes. And the only thing with the tin is, and that's why Alfred's, um I was reading work so well is that there's a little bit of air is able to get in. Okay. Okay. And so that way it won't burn up. I see. But it'll burn. So any tin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, two, two hours. It's usable. Like three hours. It's nice and soft. That's great. 
Yeah, it's blurry. I always thought you had to compress charcoal. Compressed charcoal is a whole other thing. Right. That's like in those okay. blocks. So this is just the a binder. Same thing, a little bit of binder, probably like like a like a wax kind of situation to like to compress it down. And that's why that's like you get really dark darks. Cool. But that's the thing too, is like, you know, like you buy it, you use it, it's kind of like a whole different relationship with it when you like go through every stage of the thing. It's really gratifying. Because it's Definitely. not a very expensive material. Um like when you think about like the labor that goes into making it, it's kind of ridiculous, but then the connection of it is its own. Well, that's exactly it. It connects you to the place where you were, you know, when you gathered it and it connects you to the time of the process and, and it's an ancient process, you know, so it's just, you know, such a low tech technology, but you know, who knows how to do it anymore. It's the artists that are, you know, kind of moving it forward in time. So that's really awesome. That's inspiring for sure. I would, yeah, I will recommend it. <laughs> Gratify. Ooh. All right. This was awesome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This yeah, thank fun. you so much for showing us inside of your studio. Sorry that my, like, painting collapse thing happened, but yeah. <laughs> I know it's really, this is a really weird question, but do you have any upcoming shows that possibly got postponed or yes. anything that people can see in person once the virus is over? Rachel and I, um, I'm pointing this way as if everyone's screen is configured in the same way and that they know that your box is on my screen right next to me. But anyway, Rachel and I had a video um, that we made in collaboration with Sarah Pulver, who is an another one of our collaborators that we made for Esther Klein Gallery, actually. That was the first time we had ever collaborated was for that show. Um, that was supposed to be in the Big Ears Festival in Knoxville. We were all really psyched about being part of that festival, but. Okay. That's is it going to be indefinitely, cool? right? Okay. So this is what it sounds like, I, yeah. So I guess for people who want to see more of your work, I'll just put your website back up one more time and then you'll just put updates when they become available. Yeah, and those other shows are up and should be up for the remainder of the year. That's one nice thing about working with historic um, places. Things don't move very quickly, so they, they'll still be there when the doors open up. So, yeah. All right, great. Well, thank well, you so much, Cindy. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight.